at um, take a look at Perak Chav Zion Pasuk Zion. Well, actually Chav Zion Aleph. Chav Zion. I want to finish because I want to go into Bar Midbar today. One second, I didn't say yet. Chav Zion Aleph is on page uh, seven eighteen. So the Torah goes through the the Torah fitted, goes through these various calamities. The Torah mentions the various calamities, and then on page seven eighteen, the Torah goes into a new subject here. When a man makes a vow, he pledges uh, 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 regard. The tarot called translated as evaluation. Now, the basic way this goes is a guy decides he wants to make a pledge to the base of it. Pledges can be made in numerous ways, and the pledge over here is that a guy says. I pledge my value to the base of English, or he says, I pledge his value to the base of English. When you pledge your value, so then you pledge, the value is an assigned value. So the Torah says, if it's a male between the ages of 20 and 60, that's the next book, 50 shekels for a woman, at that age, uh, in that age bra- bracket, it's 30 shekels, okay? And then if it's under for between five years old and 20, and then there's zero to five, and there's over 60. Those are the four categories of pledges. And whatever you pledge to the base of Migdash, that's what you have to pay. All situations, and the Torah says, if it's a female, it's 30. Then it says from five years old until 20 years old, so for a male, it's 20, and for a female, it's 10. Now, a five-year-old can't make a pledge. Right? But if somebody says, I pledge the value of that five-year-old, so then he owes the base of Migdash 20, 20 shekels. If it's from a month until five years old, and a month-year-old baby certainly can't make a pledge, so then again, somebody else is pledging his value. And then the last one is 60 years old. And from 60 years old, if it's a male, 60 and on, it's 15, and a female is 10. Now, we're going to go into this in a second. First of all, the question is, why would you ever want to make a pledge? Why do you make a pledge? Why do you? Why not just give the money? The answer is sometimes, let's say you don't have cash. And let's say uh, 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 somebody is in a good mood. right? Somebody got a good grade on one of his midterms in college. You go, I pledge my value to the base of Mingdash. You know, okay, 50 shekels for you. Right, which is uh, for some people, that's a grade they got on their test. But okay, he got a he got a, a fifty. They got a fifty shekel pledge to the base of English. Now, one of them, unfortunately, said, "Why does this section follow the previous section?" This will answer our other question. Well, the previous section, we just had all these various calamities and terrible things are going to happen to Jewish people. Then the Torah breaks off like completely unrelated. Okay, pledges. Why? We're not talking about pledging on a campus, by the way. You know, the, <laughs> the, we're not talking about where, where the what do you call it? Are pledging? What, what, what the hazing and the you know the, 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 the trying to get into a frat house and they're pledging and they're doing all sorts of things that all sorts of things that uh, that, 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 that even animals don't do. We're talking about we're talking about uh, we're talking about what do you call? It? We're talking about human beings here. Okay, so uh, so uh, the, uh, the I don't know if you guys ever saw there was a movie called Animal House. Oh, Did you ever yeah. see Animal House? It was one of the yeah. last movies I ever saw. That's with the John Belushi, and then he died. But John, but but what do you call it? the Animal House was, was was fabulous movie. I actually saw his brother Jim Belushi before he became a star. They had a place in Chicago called the Comedy Cottage. So we went down there. It was the John Belushi was already a star. Jim Belushi was on the. Uh, then he became a star right after after John died. And so Jim became a star, but I saw Jim because he was funny then also. But the 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 so, so he, we're not talking about those type of pledges. We're talking about a guy who makes a pledge. So the Mephorshim say, the Mephorshim say, why does he? Why does he? What do you call? Why does this section follow the previous section? The answer is the Torah is teaching. Whenever a person is running into a difficulty in life, we just came off of the calamities. Let's say a person has a difficulty, whether it's a financial difficulty, whether it's a medical difficulty, whether whatever the difficulty is. So our attitude is give tzedakah. Tzedakah always helps. Giving tzedakah is one of the biggest merits that a person could have. You have a calamity in your life. A person has a, has a difficulty in their life. It's always good to give tzedakah. So the Torah is saying, if these calamities happen, whether on a national level, whether on an individual level, 
So then we go into the section of pledges. That a person makes a vow, makes a pledge to the base of English. Number one. Number two, a vow in general could be that a guy, you know, let's say a guy's in his car. And there's a near miss. The guy just swerved that there was a near exit. The guy goes, oh, man, I could have been getting, you know, the guy says, oh, you know what, I want to, you know, I'm making a netter to, uh, for example, guys, I make a netter, I, I pledge 20 shekels to the base of English, just because he doesn't have cash on it. So a person may make a pledge when a person is inspired under certain circumstances, a person makes a pledge. So it could be that a person pledges his own value because he's in a good mood, or maybe one of his kids had an operation and he survived it, and the guy says, yeah, I'm pledging the kid's value to the base of Migdash, that sort of thing. So the Torah says there's an assigned value over here, and the assigned value, the male's value, is always on a higher level than the female's value. We're going to talk about males and females today also on a different, different, completely different uh, uh, subject, but, but that, that's what the Torah says over here. Yeah, go ahead. So it's just a, a pledge in that it's sort of an honor of that person. Like it's, it's not putting a marker on that person's head in any way or something. That what, this, what the Torah says here? Yeah, like yeah there's an assigned value, and it doesn't make a difference who the person is, whether he's the biggest Talmud Chacham in the world, or he's a truck driver, it doesn't make a difference. If he's a male between the ages of 20 and 60, it's 50 shekel kesef. Okay. That's what the Torah says. It's a donation. Right? It's a donation, to the, and you're pledging his value. And his value, according, a person could pledge, there's actually an example in the Mishnah, there's an example in the Mishnah of a woman who donated her son's weight in gold to the base of English every day. She was wealthy. She donated her son's weight in gold to the basement. You could do that also. A person can make any pledge you want. You can follow anything. A guy can say, I am giving his weight in gold to the basement. Because that's what you have to do. That's what you have to do. So these are the various pledges. Okay, somebody was going to ask. May I ask a question? No, I mean, just uh, every day. Every day. The manager says there's a woman, she's a very wealthy woman. She gave her son's weight in gold every day. And then she gave that money. And then that, when the money is given to the base of English, there are various uses that are described for it. We, you can either buy corbanos with it, depending on how it was pledged. You, 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 corbanos, that sort of thing. Okay, yeah, yeah go ahead. It's, it's not literally tracking their net worth. Otherwise, she couldn't be able to pledge, she couldn't continuously pledge her son's weight in gold. What is this value thing that it's tracking, if not how much money they own or in total? Here, right now? It's not, it has nothing to do with how much money they own. It has to do with the guy who decides to pledge. And sort of when he uses this particular uh, 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 style of speech, he says, I pledge my value. How much are you worth? How much are you worth? You're worth 50 shekel kesef. This is even a White Sox fan who says, I pledge my value to the base of English. I mean, a guy says, I pledge my value to the base of a White Sox fan. Basically, you should pay him money. You're worth less than nothing. In the, in the base of English, in the base of English, he has to give 50 shekel kesef to the base of English. That's how extreme it is. So I don't know what it's tracking. Okay, now, now, hold, hold, hold for one second. I want to show you something here. That's why, so why this follows the previous one or this follows the previous one, is to teach us that in life, when a person is having a situa- difficult situation, it's, it's always good to give an editor to tzedakah. It's always good to make a pledge to tzedakah, to give tzedakah. Tzedakah is a tremendous merit to help a person avoid or get out of trouble. It's not an automatic, it's not guaranteed, but it's one of the best things that a person can do, particularly because it hurts. It hurts. It shows devotion. Hold all the questions for a few minutes now. I want, I want, I want, I want to show you something. Because this is, this is very important. If you look at Pesach Zion, now look again. I, I, I need you to hear the values. A man between the ages of 20 and 60 is worth 50. Not worth. That's his, the value of the Torah signs. A woman between the ages of 20 and 60 is worth, it, her value is 30. Now look what happens after 60. It's a Pesach Zion. It's about halfway down the page. Pesach Zion. The imi ben shishim shon of Amala. What about after 60 years old? Im Zachar, if he's a male, Vehaya Erkecha Chamesha Asar Shakel. Fifteen. He goes from fifty to fifteen. Vilanekeva Asar Shkolim. She goes from thirty to ten. Who has lost more objective value? The man. Man. The man. Yeah. He's gone. He's lost more than two thirds. Right. Right. He's lost more than a woman. Six. Is is reduced by two thirds exactly. She goes from thirty to ten. And a man is reduced by more than two thirds. He goes from fifty to fifteen. Look at Rashi. It's the right column of Rashi, four lines of above. It's possibly we're never supposed to say that we like one part of the Torah more than another. But I have a certain fondness for this Rashi. This is such a penetrating Rashi. Rashi <laughs> says, right column, four lines to the bottom. The imi ben shishim shana, kishem agiel zikna. When they get to the age, to, to old age. Ha'isha krova lehechashev ke'ish. The woman is closer. She closes the gap. 
she's closer to the value of the man. The man goes down to, 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 to less than a third. The woman goes down to one third. Why? There's an old saying. When there's an old man in the house, there's a nuisance in the house. When there's an old lady in the house, Sima Bevesa is a treasure in the house, the Simana Tova Bevesa, and a good omen in the house. How do you like that? That means when there's an old man in the house, so an old man in the house, the old grandpa in the house, where maybe people don't want to say it, <laughs> maybe nobody's saying it, but everybody's thinking it, right? He's a pain, right? He's basically <laughs> an obstacle and a nuisance. Right, he said, tells you. He just said, kind of says the same stories over and over. Oh, yeah. Right, and if he ever catches your ear because you happen to walk into the room and say, "Hey, you know, I just want to tell you something." <laughs> you know, did I ever tell you? You know, my friend Max. You know, I says to him, I says, Max, I says, <laughs> you know, I says, you know, and, and he just kind of stretches it out and tells you the same story over and over. So he does, he basically keeps it uh, right, and then that he loses, he can't find his dentures, right, and he trips up the kitchen. That's what that's what they all have. An old man in the kitchen, uh, men in general, by the way, men in general in the kitchen are uh, men even from men. Uh, you, you know, I know my, my my wife is not like this, but I've I've seen it where a man walks into the kitchen and as soon as he walks in, the wife is just spotting him the whole time, <laughs> right? You know, and as soon as she, 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 that's the parva knife, that's a parva knife. And, oh, oh, you know, <laughs> right? True or not true? Right? You got the you got so the spotter scary. on you. You got the scanner. She's all over you, right? Because men, you know, all we're thinking about is getting to the food, right? Where the woman is thinking about the religion, you know. And, and the man, man, you know, so, so 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 a man, it's not a joke. What's a woman in the home? A woman in the home, an older woman in the home, a bubby in the home. She's basically doing the same role, maybe a little slower. She helps with the babies, she helps make a babysit, she can change diapers, she cooks, she bakes. And not only that, she's got the life experience of how to run domestics. A man's been out of his out of the home the entire life. Oh. He's been the big hacker. And all of a sudden when he's got his, you know, he was the guy trying he runs he controls the house, he controls the money, controls everything, and all of a sudden he's trapped in the house. And 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 what is he what can he do? He can't help with the kids. He can't help with the cooking. He can't. So what's he doing in the house? Why am I fond of this Rashi? Because there's an important lesson here, which is get out of the house. <laughs> Stay out of the house. Right? That's the lesson. The best thing for a man, the best thing for a wife, is that the man should be out of the house. And if a man develops a taste for Torah, so that when he gets a little older and he's no longer working and he's retired, one of the worst things, there are two things that are poison. What is a new word? The one of your word, toxic. toxic. Uh, that's one of the one of the new words. Uh, toxic. He's got a toxic personality. Toxic. He's toxic. <laughs> you know, it's not in my comfort zone. Right? He's toxic. I have to express myself. Thank you for letting me share. Right? He's he's he's, he's toxic. Right? One of the most one of the most toxic. Did that air conditioner get turned off? Yeah, I turned it off. Uh huh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Guess what? <laughs> Guess what? Guess what you're about to do right now. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for not being toxic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What I do, you know, I do with my kids. I say, can you stand up? My kids stand up. I say, while you're up, can you get me to catch up? <laughs> I'm just say so. If you stand up, they're good. While you're up, can you turn on the air conditioning? So the the, 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 the a man a man who's in the home number one working in the house nowadays that's one of the one of the worst uh, uh, casual casualties of technology is men work at home mm-hmm. not good not good in the best of marriages in the best of marriages one of the the one of the one of the the important recipes for success is that a couple is away from each other the idea that absence makes the heart grow fonder is a hundred percent true a couple, you, know, you got to take all that Hollywood nonsense and all that garbage of there. You spend more more time together is not necessarily better. Obviously, a couple has to spend some time together, and a couple once in a while has to, you know, they have to talk to each other and they have to take a walk or they have to go out to dinner <laughs> or that sort of thing. But more time, the mistake is that more is not better. You have to have an occupation. When a man is older, what are you going to occupy yourself with? If a man has not developed a taste for Torah, 
doesn't mean you have to learn in kolal all day. <clears throat> and it doesn't mean you have to, if a man does not develop a taste for Torah, so then what's he going to do when he retires? He's stay home and would tell his wife what the weather is? <laughs> and, you know, what the way he's going to watch TV and tell her to give her the weather report? And the Torah is telling you over here that a man in the home, we're not talking about a Talmud Chacham, a Talmud Chacham in the home, he could be consulted, people want to talk to him, he's got wisdom of Torah, and so on and so forth. Number one. Number two, he's generally not in the home. Because he goes out to learn, and he goes to the shul, and he goes to, he has a chavrusa, and he tries to learn as much as possible. So he's not even in the home that much. Even when he's older, it's an occupation that you don't need a lot, a whole lot of physical energy for. You just need to get off to a base medrash. So the Torah says, and an old woman in the home is the best thing. A bubby in the home. She helps out with the kids. She helps with the cooking. She helps, it. she's a treasure in the home. She's a, and the Torah tells you, it sounds like, it's like a joke. In general, it's not a joke at all. And a person has to plan towards this. Somebody, my parents, I remember my parents had a friend, and they asked me, this guy was in a panic because he was heading towards a, a mandatory retirement age. I think he was already 70 or 75, something like that. And they, they were the company, he was an accountant, and the company was that was done. So my parents said to me, what do you think he should do? He's in a panic. What's he going to do after he retires? Right? What's he going to do? Right? I mean, you, 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 uh, uh, the poor guy, you know, he was an accountant, and he never developed... So I said to my parents, first of all, what did he ever do when he was on vacation? What did you ever do? Remember, I told you yesterday about discretionary time. Your discretionary time is an indication of where you're really, what do you do in your discretionary time? So I said to my parents, first of all, what did, what did he ever do on vacation? He had two-week vacations. What did he ever do? So the two-week vacations, he managed to somehow pass them because he knew he was going back to work. So I told my parents, the first thing he has to do is make a daily schedule. He has to make a daily schedule. I get up at 7, and you go for a walk. And then you go and you learn a little bit. And then you go out and putter in the garden a little bit. Then you come home and you eat lunch and you take a nap. And then you go out to the, what do you call it, you know, go do some volunteer work or something. Go, go, go visit your kids. Go, be, go you know, bother your grandchildren. Whatever it is that you do, whatever it is that you do, but you have to have a daily schedule. You can't just get up and away. What am I going to do today? Because that, 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 that's very depressing for a person. And so the Torah is telling you over here, you got to develop a taste for it. If you don't need to develop a taste for Torah when a person doesn't develop, develop a taste for Torah when they're young, to develop a taste for Torah when they're old is just very, very challenging. It certainly can't hurt. It certainly can't hurt to try. But the more a person develops that taste when they're younger, the better it's going to be when they get older. Let's go on to Farshas by Midbar. Uh-huh. Yeah. I was wondering, like, uh, these uh, evaluations, is it like, um, for example, we have the uh, value of the firstborn and we redeem him? The that's concept? not the same kind. That, that, that's a different. That's a Torah sign the amount, amount that the coin gets. That's not the same valuation. Yisrael, what were you going to ask? Sorry. Oh, uh, is there a specific amount of, of, of tilakim you should be giving? No, anything that a person could afford is good. Whatever a person could afford is good. Yeah, very quickly. Go ahead. Yeah, I understand the woman loses less value, but if she sounds so much more valuable, why is her actual amount of shekel donation? It's a good question because ultimately the man has the obligation, the, the mitzvah obligations. So That's why in general, a, 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 woman, a, a woman starts out at a higher level, a man has greater potential. A woman by nature is more spiritual. A man by nature is more more uh, well behaved. Uh, men have a much bigger yetsahara. But, but a man, even when, even when they're younger, the woman's value is less. Right, yeah. but it, but uh, because a woman by definition has a greater has it, she's got it easier in a certain way because she's more naturally attuned to doing the right things. Okay. I say most men, if they weren't married, they would end up in prison. Right, because the wife, and you see that you see that even woman leaders, even woman world leaders, you have men world leaders, women world leaders. You know, all the lunatics who want to take over the world. It's usually been the men. Even the women world leaders, they never seem to have that goal of 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 let's conquer the world. They were never like this Erdogan or, or Putin or these, these these lunatics who want to take over the whole world. The women, they they wanted to get to the, the they, they they want to get the, to say okay, so some of them were, were you know they she became the prime minister or the or the whatever the chancellor whatever it is. But they, you never got that sense that they that, that they wanted to conquer the entire world. They never got the yeah, even Margaret Thatcher who was known as the iron the iron lady. I mean, she said she didn't get a sense that she wants to conquer the world. Where the men are out of control, they're totally out of control. That's a basic behavioral pattern in men. So a man who is bigger, got a bigger yetsahara, and he overcomes it. The more your difficult the job is, the more you've overcome. So the higher level you could get to. Number one. Number two. There's the idea that the men are the ones who have the obligations. The woman. So there is a certain value as a what do you call? It. But she closes the gap. She closes the gap, and frankly, I know some women, <laughs> if not for the Torah saying that, like exactly like you say, not for the Torah saying she closed the gap, I'd say, I'd say the gap has been reversed. 
by a long shot. But that's the assigned, that's what the value of the Torah assigns. Thank you, I think the world, they should be world women world leaders, you know, then everybody, you know, then they could imagine a meeting, you know, let's communicate. You know? <laughs> 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 I'll put away your nuclear arms. You know, you know. <laughs> I can't make it, i got to get a hairdresser today. I'll say, well, we're putting off the meeting. <laughs> okay. Oh, terrible. Yeah. They say that they say there should be two traffic lanes. There should be one lane for the men and one lane for the women. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> you can see the speed limit size. Yo, 55, 12. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, I'm not. Man, no, you're not. <laughs> Seven twenty six. <laughs> 726. So Hashem speaks to Moshe. We are now in Parshas and Sefer Bamidbar. And Bamidbar is translated in English as what? In the wilderness. No. Desert. No, the book itself is translated. Not the word. What, what is that? Numbers. 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 The book of Bamidbar is translated as numbers, which is a strange translation for Bamidbar. And the reason it's called numbers is because we see several times in Sefer Bamidbar that the Jewish people are counted. And that's why it's called numbers. But in 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 in, in uh, it, 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 is called Genesis. There's a fly in here, yeah. Bereshis is called Genesis. Shmos is called Exodus. Right? These are not translated. Bereshis in Genesis is a translation. Shmos is called Exodus because that's the theme of the book is leaving Egypt. Vayikra is called Leviticus. Why? Because it's called Torah Salavim. Because it's all about the Levites, all about the service in the base of English. But Midbar is called Numbers because of the counting. And in Dvarim, which I never understood why, it's called Deuteronomy. It's called Deuteronomy. Anybody know why it's called Deuteronomy? They got deutered. Right? What, why is it called Deuteronomy? <laughs> Good. Deuce. Comes from the word deuce. Because it's a, it's it's what's Holy called County. the medrash. The medrash calls it the medrash calls it uh, what do you call it? the the re- repetition of, of of many things are repeated, and therefore it's called Deuteronomy, which because the root of the word is dus. So here it starts talking about the the the, 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 the sefer bamidbar. Now, the uh, um, the theme of the parsha is going to be counting, and there are several ideas here. First of all, you have to realize the Jewish people in the midbar. That experience has never ever been repeated again for mankind or for the Jewish people. You never had the entire people concentrated in one place with the clear uh, demonstration of God's presence, because there were all these miracles, the clouds of glory in the Mishkan, for 40 years in the desert. You never had this experience before. So the Midbar was a training ground for the Jewish people when they were in the desert for 40 years that was a training ground for the Jewish people that was a preparation for 40 years and they had free room and board right they had the clouds of glory they had manna falling down from heaven they had water they had a tent they had, they, they had water and all they had to do was focus on their spiritual development in the midbar for 40 years which lays the groundwork it plants the seeds for the future development of the people. So you know, often stop and think of the people you are going through a desert. But you have to understand there was a purpose for this. There was a purpose going through the desert and being concentrated. And by the way, not only the Jewish people were all concentrated in one place, it's the most uh, 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 um, closed off they've ever been from the influence of the outside world. Right? There's never been that type of Jewish neighborhood, B'nai Brock notwithstanding. Uh, there's never been that sort of from enclave, which is completely protected and completely uh, 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 avoiding the influences of the negative world that they're doing for 40 years in the desert. Now, what do they do in the desert? First of all, the commentary is the, commentary is a person, the, the idea of a midbar is actually the Gemara says a person should turn himself into a midbar. In order to acquire Torah, you have to turn yourself into a midbar. What does that mean? If you want to really master Torah, you have to be a midbar. What does it mean, but what does that what does that mean? Very, very intriguing statement, right? What does it mean to be a midbar, to be a desert? Like Avram Avinu. Like Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu. He open, was open to open. Okay, to what? To, to the elements. Open to what? You're correct. You have to be open. Yeah. Well, this is, I like this because. Well, what? Go ahead. 
you have to empty yourself out of everything you had before. That's true. That's true. The person has to try to figure out how to get rid of all the nonsense that's in their head. How do you, by the way, how do you do that? And we don't have a delete button. Uh, what's that? No. No, 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 no. Isolation doesn't get rid of it. Isolation just creates depression. What is, what is, uh, what, how do you get rid of all that? We got a lot of, we got a head full of nonsense. Studying Torah. Right? Oh, why is that? Because each word of Torah that goes in pushes a piece of nonsense out. And each piece of nonsense that comes in pushes some Torah out. How do you like that? You know where, you know where this is one of the profundities of Sherlock Holmes? Where, where Watson, and the very first time they meet, Watson is trying, is trying to figure out who this guy is. So he mentions something about Copernicus's theorem. What was his theorem about the earth going around the sun or the sun going around the earth? That was it. So, so he mentions it to Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes says, what is that? So he says, you don't know what that is? He says, no, what is that? So he says, well, it's the idea that, what was it, the sun goes around the earth, or whatever it was that he said to him. So Sherlock Holmes says, oh, that's very interesting. And now that you've told me, I'm going to do my best to forget it. This is why we want to forget it. <coughs> so Sherlock Holmes says an idea. I don't know where Conan Doyle got this, but this is very much a Torah ideal. Torah, Sherlock Holmes says, the way I see it, the mind could only retain a certain amount of information. And every useless piece of information pushes out a piece of information that I need for my profession, which is being a, which is being a detective, and every, which is a very much a Torahic idea. Because the Torah idea is that every piece of nonsense pushes out some Torah. The more Torah you put into your mind, the more it pushes out the nonsense. A mead bar, very good, Jonathan, good, good idea. I mean, we have to empty ourselves out, that's true, but the only way we could do that is by, being a, by, by learning Torah. A mead bar is hefker. Anybody who wants could walk through the desert. A person has to make himself hefker for other people. That means part of acquiring Torah is, I'm willing to help people, anybody who needs help. I'm willing to, to teach Torah to anybody who needs to be taught Torah. That a person isn't thinking about himself. Because the nature of Torah is not like any other study. The nature of Torah, you know, somebody would tell you, uh, if you want to do well on a physics test, you have to do some chesed. Go out and help people, and then you'll do well on your physics. You want to do well on a physics test, you've got to study physics day and night. Whereas when it comes to Torah, there are all sorts of, you have to be humble, and, and you have to help people, and you have to, there's a whole list of 48 ways to acquire Torah, because Torah does not go into, Torah is not an intellectual pursuit only. Torah is something that goes to a soul, a neshama, that has made itself capable of absorbing Torah. So you have to be, in order to turn yourself into a magnet for Torah, you, can't take, you can take much more precious metals, but they're not going to pick anything up. The only way that Torah is going to stick to a person, he turns himself into a magnet. To turn himself into a magnet, you have to have the characteristic of a magnet. It's a characteristic, it's not just the mind of a magnet. Magnet doesn't, you have to have the characteristic. So you have to be a midbar, means you have to be a person who is willing to, number one, allow others into your world. But number two, a midbar means that, you ever see a businessman, a guy who's a, a, a guy comes out of law school, a guy takes his first job as a lawyer, how many hours a day do they work? How much? 80 a week. A lot, right? Some of these guys sleep in the office, right? Some guys actually sleep in the office. They have no life other than what they're doing. They've made themselves totally hefker for the job that they have to do. Mm-hmm. A guy who's into money, a businessman, he, he lives, eats, breathes, drinks, that's a business. A person who wants to be, in Torah, he has to be a meat bar for Torah. And that's the only way. We have to make ourselves, obviously, we have to be nice people, and we have to eat once in a while, you have to talk to your family members once in a while. But you have to be fully devoted to Torah. Like a midbar is hefker, we are hefker for Torah. That is one of the ideas. Now, more than that. Now, this is the, 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 the key point I want to get to today. Look at Posig Base, and you'll see that there's a, 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 something, a, 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 something puzzling here. Se'u'es rosh kol adas Israel. Take a head count of the Jewish people. The word se'u, by the way, means literally to, to, to take up. Se'u is like se'u, she'arim rasheichem, to lift up. So it's using a very turn, an interesting turn of phrase. When you count the Jewish people, lift the Jewish people. Which is strange. Why, why, why is it called, why is it being counted called lifted? Encouraging. What? Encouraging. Oh, how's it good, 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 good. How's it going to be encouraging? Let's see. Then it says, "Su'u es rosh kol das v'zel limish bechosam lebeis avosam by their families, according to their 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 fathers' houses." And then here is one of the most puzzling expressions: "B'mispar shemos by the number of names, kol zochar legilgalosam, every male by a head count." Now you're not going to believe this. First of all, 
What does it mean by the number of names? If I want to count people in a room, I'd say one, two, three, four. If I, if I start counting by saying John, Mike, Tom, Bill, I haven't counted. Well, all I've done is, 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 is recited a list of names. I haven't, how, how's that? I'm not counting. It doesn't tell me anything. So what does it mean by the number of names? You're either, in, uh, uh, how does that work? So there are commentaries that say that they wrote their names on a piece of paper and handed it in. So you counted how many pieces of papers there are with names on that. Because we don't count one, two, three, four. Right? Whenever we want to count, how do we count? We, 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 we say, Hoshia es amecho varich es nachlasecho. We count the words. Right? Have you ever heard people count that way? When they want to count that way. So, right, the, 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 the people do that. People say, because they, they, it also has ten words. That's not safe. Because then you may go, mm, no. No, and then take a bite out of the guy so you don't make a half sick. You know? so, so we don't want to do that. But, but the, and the reason we say Hoshia Samecha not only has ten words, but Hoshia Samecha means deliver your people, save your people, which is the opposite of the plague, which is a consequence of counting people one, two, three, four. So, that we, so that's why specifically that puzzle. Hoshia Samecha Ubarech Samecha. Bless your people, don't curse them. Mm. That's why it's counted that way. Have you ever seen it? That's how they count yeah. in a minion. Have you ever been to the minion factories? Have you ever see a guy standing out there? At center, at center. We need a tenth guy. Ever see that? The guy stands there. At center, at center. You walk in there, there are three people in there. <laughs> then, he, then he stands outside says, At center, at center. Right? And then another guy comes. Finally, when he's got nine, he stands there. At center, mamish. <laughs> he's really now now we're really on the tenth one. Yeah, yeah, that's happy. At center, I am running in, you know, where is it? <laughs> You're sitting there, four guys putting their drill on. Hey, what happened here? And he goes back out. At center, at center. Right. So, so the 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 the, uh, the 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 Torah uses over here a very strange expression by the number of names. Count them by the number of names. Okay. So the idea is that the Torah is reminding us, and this is exactly what you said. Why it's encouraging. Each one of us has a role. When you're a number, if I say you're number four, right? Or I, better yet, I say you're the fourth. What would your reaction be? When I'm the first. What? When I why aren't I the first? That's your reaction. Uh, okay. Well, <laughs> you're first. You don't know what you don't know what we're talking about, though, right? Okay. Right, right. Okay. You're the fourth one into the principal. Now, will you still want to be the first? <laughs> uh, not so much. The, okay. If I say to you, you're the fourth. <laughs> if I say you're the fourth, what would your reaction be? Oh, make my what? day, somebody. Fourth of what? Uh, yes, I would say the fourth of what? For the what? But if I say if you're the fourth, I, my reaction is the fourth of what? But I know one thing. I know that there's a group here, and I'm being counted as part of a group because there are obviously three before me. I don't know how many there are in total. When you're a number, it means you're part of a group. When you're a name, you're an individual. The Torah here is telling you what the role of every Jew is. You are both a number and you're an individual. That means a number, you're a member of Klai Israel. You're a member of Jews. There's no such thing as Lone Rangers. There's no such thing as Lone Ranger Bergs. Right? You're, 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 you're a part of the group. You dive in with the minion. You live in a Jewish community. Don't do things off on your own. On the other hand, you're a name. And a name is the definition. You know that the, the word neshama, the word neshama, which is a, which is a, a soul, a neshama, the middle two letters of neshama are the tal shin mem, which is shame, which is a name. That means the essence, your name is a description of your neshama. That means we have a tradition that parents, when they name a child at the bris, there's a certain level of ruach hakodesh where they give him a name, that this is a description of his neshama. His neshama is his whatever, whatever that means. I mean, you can have more than one person named Chaim. Right? I don't know exactly what that means. But there is some sort of, your name is who you are. And therefore, the Torah is telling you, you've got an individual role, which means you have to fulfill your potential with your capabilities and your talents. On the other hand, don't forget that you're a member of Klai, so you're a number. Kol zochar l'gogolosam, every male by a head count. Now, believe it or not, you're not going to believe this. Do you know the Gemara says that somebody came to Rabbi Yudah Nasi, and he said, if a man has two heads, which head does he put his tefillin on? It's Gemara Menachos. And the Flam and Zion. The guy came to Rabbi Yudan Nasi and said, if a man is born with two heads, which head does he put his tefillin on? 
So Rabbi Yudanasi said, okay, either you get, either you choose, either you choose flogging or you, go, or you get excommunicated for asking such a time-wasting, stupid, silly question. <laughs> At the next moment, the man walked in, he said, my son was born with two heads, how do I do a pidyon haben oh. for the Kohen? Do I have to redeem both heads or only one head? <laughs> <laughs> So Rabbi Yudanasi said, okay, sorry, my bad. Yeah. My bad. <laughs> my bad. Okay, I guess it's a possibility. And the Gemara talks about what happened. <laughs> that, how, how you redeem it. The Chassam Sofer says, based on that, Kol Zohar L'Gugulosam, it's a head count. It's a head count over here. That means if there would have been a Jew in the desert with two heads, you count both. <laughs> you count both. Yeah. And people who have no head at all, <laughs> that's all right, that, which is probably more common. <laughs> that's much more common. But if a people, if, if you have what do you call it, if you have, if you have what do you call it, you have a, 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 a that's like just to show you that it's all there in the Torah. They cover it, where it's all covered in the Torah, but more than that. I, I, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not happy about this, and you won't be either, be either but I'm going to just tell you what it says. The word legul golosum. He has in it the word. First of all, you know why a, 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 a head is called a gil, a gil, gulgolas. A skull. a skull is called a gulgolas. It comes from the Hebrew word galgal. Galgal is round. And not only galgal. Look at the word over here because you have the first lit gulgolos. look at the letters galgal. Give a lamed, give a lamed. And it's called round. It's called a galgal. A galgal is a word that that, that repeats on itself. Give a lamed, give a lamed. Right, like a like 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 a wheel. What's a wheel called in Hebrew? A gal. Galgal is a wheel. Mm. Why is it called a wheel? Because it repeats. The wheel goes around. It repeats on itself. That's why it's called galgal. What's a gal alone? Just a gal is a wave because the waves are the same thing. They keep coming at you. So a galgal is like a very, a very close, a very, very close to like, like a wave. A gal is a wave. A galgal is a wheel, and a head is a gulgolus because it's for most people it's round. So the, 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 so, so the head. It's a head count. But what else is included? What word do you hear in the word Galgal? What else is what? Else, what is the Gilgul. famous Gilgul, which is what? A reincarnate. Reincarnation. Why is it called Gilgul? Same idea. You know, like bringing them back. So the Kabbalists say, okay, there's all sorts of ideas about 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 reincarnation. Reincarnation is for, according to most, it is a Torah idea. That means that the chances are we've been together before. Oh. As a matter of fact, I think you owe me 20 bucks from our last time around. We'll talk afterward. <laughs> Did you ever pay me? I don't remember that. Back, you know, back in Spain in the 1400s, I don't remember you paying me. The, uh, so so there, there's an idea, I told you that, that there's an idea of reincarnation that a person, according to some Kabbalists, the person can come around four times until he gets it right. Other Kabbalists say there's no end. You keep coming back until you get it right. And, and uh, uh, according to other Kabbalists, women generally do not come back in a reincarnation. Mm-hmm. Only men come back. Where do they see it from? Where, where it's alluded to? It says, kol zohar Gogolosa. Mm-hmm. Every male. Right? Now, why don't women come back? And this is what we started speaking about earlier. Why don't women come back? Because they're more oh, spiritual? Because they generally get it right. Yeah, they, they generally get it right. That's why I tell you, you're not going to be happy to hear this. Mm-hmm. Right? The, women, the women generally get it right. I tell you, men are, let's face it, we're out of control. Men are out of, basically, essentially out of control. Yep. Right? So, so and the, one, the things that control us are women. So you right? can't, a man can't, will not be reincarnated as a woman. A man could be reincarnated as a female, and a person could be reincarnated as a dog. Somebody who, is, somebody who is particularly immoral could come back as a dog. People could be reincarnated as inanimate objects. Oh. Right, fella? <laughs> the, uh, uh, people could be, people, people, yeah, people can be reincarnated and be reincarnated as dog. Now, one of the most frightening lines that I've ever heard anywhere in Torah is the man, now listen to this, this is a good one, John. This will keep you up at night. If a man could die and leave all of his money to... His, to his dog. children is nishkeferlach. To his dog, people do that. Life. Oh, to his wife also. Not the end of the world. He could die and leave the medrash. He could die and leave all of his money to his wife's next husband. Oh. Oh, that's smart. Whoa. Yeah. How do you like Whoa. that? That's why Mrs. Heinz. Yikes. Right. Mrs. Heinz married John Kerry. Did you know that Henrietta Heinz from the Heinz ketchup guy? Oh, he's. She when he died, she married. John Kerry, and all that Heinz money went to pay for his fancy hairdo. 
right? If, if, if Mr. Heinz would have known that his wife's going to marry John Kerry, he probably would have eaten mustard, right? You know, the, the, you know this, is, this is, I spent my whole life making ketchup for this guy to use it as hair, as hair cream. You know, that, that's what I spent my whole life for. Now, even more than that, just one second, gentlemen, I, that's just the tip of the iceberg, right? Now, Mr. Heinz, uh, not, I don't want. I don't know about him. He may have been a nice guy. I don't know. Yeah, I like ketchup, but, but but it could be it could be that you know a guy dies. Let's say a guy dies, right? Ruvain dies, and he comes back as a dog. In the meantime, Shimon marries his wife, and they go to the kennel and they buy a pet. They buy Ruvain the dog. How do you like that? Oh and not God. only that, when you have brought back as an as an animal, when a person, when a person is brought back as a dog in a reincarnation. They remember that they were once a human being. Oh, oh, that's bad. When a person is reincarnated as a human being, they don't remember their previous incarnation. And anybody who thinks they do, right, where they say deja vu is reincarnation, well, deja vu means you didn't get enough sleep, or, or, or it's what he called drug flashback. But it has nothing to do, nothing to do with, nothing to do with, 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 with it. So people don't remember. But if a person, one second, Miguel, it gets worse. When a person is brought back as a dog, or an animal, they do remember their previous incarnation. So this dog, Ruvain, could be sitting at the table where he's been purchased by his wife and his next husband, oh Shimon, who is now enjoying his money, Whoa. and they're sitting at the table talking, and he'd like to say something, and all that comes out is a bark. Whoa. And his wife says, oh, he's hungry, throw him a crust, will you? throw him a bone, will you? Yeah, that's bad, gentlemen. And therefore, the lesson here is be good. <laughs> Don't become a dog. <laughs> so I think there is. I think there is a what do you call it? There is a uh, there is a source that says he could come back as a female, which is supposed to be very degrading. Women in general are not brought back. However, the Benish Chai says, on the on the, on the Benish Chai says on the Medrash, there, there's a, a Gemara the statement in the Gemara that says Isha Tova. A good wife, matana tova labayla. A good wife is a precious gift to her husband. And on that statement, the Ben Ishchai says, what does it mean she's a precious gift? So the basic meaning is, you know, a wife does everything for her. All a wife needs a little appreciation, and they're fine. All they need is a little appreciation. That's all they need. If you appreciate them, they're not looking for honor like men are. They're not looking for conquest. They're just looking, they need a little appreciation. Just say thank you. Just say thank you and tell her how nice she looks. That's all she needs. A woman can be brought back in an incarnation she got it right the first time around and her husband messed up and she's brought back in an incarnation to marry him again to help him get it right the second time that's why she's a gift she doesn't really have to be here I always tell the ladies, never bring that up in conversation. <laughs> yeah. It's not the sort of thing. Sometimes I think when you're having a little argument with your husband, you know, well, listen, you know, I don't really have to be here. It's only because of you. <laughs> don't, be, don't be indiscreet. Don't be indiscreet. Just be nice, right? But that is, but, but according to the commentaries, a, a, what do you call it? A woman, a woman, women don't come back as, as often. Women don't come back as often as men. That's what it says. That's what it says. What can I tell you? Okay, but that's that's how we yeah. it. there's a complication. So, but if you're reincarnated as a dog, you know, you lose free will because of the reincarnation chain. And I, I'll tell you, I know about as much about reincarnation as I do about the topography in Afghanistan. I only know, <laughs> I only know, I only know that the, I only know that the concept exists. Exactly how these things work. It could be he deserves to lose his free choice, and that's part of his punishment, and that way he gets his atonement. By the way, do you know that when there's an idea that, that, that there's an idea that Sadiqim could come back as chicken or fish, wow. and that when you when you use when you eat them at the Shabbos table, that elevates their soul. Have you ever, yeah. right? Have you ever, yeah. Hey, pass me that drumstick, will ya? Here's some here, here's some Ghanaian for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And, and, fish, and fish, fish. The idea is because fish are in water. Water is Torah. So there, there is such an idea. That's not a punishment. That's an idea. Do you know that the Gemara says? I get the words like the Gemara says that when there was a calf, there, that Rabbi Yudan Nasi, Rabbi Yudan Nasi was suffered for 13 years. He had what 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 we would call a a a, a kidney stone for for half the time, and half the time he had an excruciating toothache. And the reason he had the suffering is because there was a calf that was being taken off to be shechted. Come on, Bob The calf was being taken off to be shechted, and the calf came and put his head in Rabbi Yudha Nasi's lap, indicating, I'd rather not be shechted. And Rabbi Yudha Nasi said, go, that's what you were created for. And that insensitivity, that insensitivity 
was what he called was a uh, 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 cost him 13 years of pain, and he only lost the he was only relieved of the pain when there were some rodents in the house and his maid was going to sweep them out of the house. He said, "Leave them alone." The pasuk says, "Hashem has mercy on all his creatures." That's when it was relieved. So the Ben Ishchai says that that calf that came through Rabbi Yehuda Nasi was actually a reincarnation of somebody in a calf. And the Rabbi Yonasi was saying that that's his ultimate, his ultimate tikkun is going to be to be shechted. So there are concepts, but again, your question is a valid question. I don't know enough about it. I don't know anything about the subject. I don't know the concept exists, right? And it could vary. That's why it could be husbands and wives. That's why a lot of conversations they have sounds like familial. Didn't we speak about this once before? <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, in the, you know, in the, in the 16th century, you know, we were around together. And you got the same mother-in-law? Whoa! Whoa. Whoa. Bring on the dog! <laughs> See you guys. <laughs>